right? Okay, apologies to anyone who tuned in a couple of minutes before 11 or even on 11. We've had a technical hitch or two. We hope that's it. But instead of me doing my usual chit chat, chat, I will hand over to Graham now. Well, thank you, Christine, and welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church. Uh, thank you for connecting with us as we join together in this virtual way to worship and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. While the coronavirus pandemic caught us in the middle of Matthew's telling of the Sermon on the Mount, now, in our 15th live stream service, we're further on in Matthew's Gospel, and today we're looking at chapter 23, the fifth block of teaching. Today's theme is the terrible danger of straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Stay with us. We're going to begin with a brief prelude played by Amanda uh, from Adelaide. Uh, she's in our thoughts and prayers along with her friends this morning. Prelude in G major. Thank you, Amanda. Shall we join together in prayer as we commence today? Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation to draw near and for the assurance of Jesus that where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. We thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit to connect us across the miles and around the world. We ask your blessing upon all who tune in to be with us in this service. And we pray that we might all together find ourselves exalting the Lord Jesus Christ and bowing to him and living our lives as his friends and his servants. We ask it for his glory. Amen. Now Christine is going to present uh, some reflections on Young at Heart. Thank you, Christine. Today I'm um, speaking about another story with a happy ending. <laughs> and I should say for our own members, Sonia is with us today in church. And it's just as it was when Amanda was with us a few times. It's so lovely to have Sonia here. Anyway, in the middle of June, an elderly West Australian fisherman spent hours with his leg wedged in rocks on the straits rugged south coast screaming for help initially and then eventually crying plaintively every so often. This man Walter Bazalic, aged 78, was fishing on the rocks about 20 kilometers west of Ad Albany when he found himself in this nightmare of a situation. He explained afterwards that 
because thankfully there wasn't afterwards, a wave came onto the rocks behind me and I put my rod down and looked around to see how I could get out safely. The next thing I knew I was banging my knees, head and shoulders and before I knew what was happening I was lodged, jammed in the crevice. Now this part of the West Australian coast has recorded several rock fishing deaths in recent years because of the southern ocean swell and because these are such good fishing locations if you don't drown. It was fortunate for Mr. Bazalich that his right foot was actually pinned between two large boulders. So I think that was the crevice. That stopped him falling onto the rocks below where there were two meter high waves. He said, my left side, you can just imagine it, my left side was hanging out in open air, but my right foot was stuck in a gap. My entire weight was, right, was resting on my right leg and then I lifted my right hand and found a small ledge and hung on there. About four hours he was there. Now he reached a point where he was so exhausted he'd lost all feeling in his legs. He could hardly even say help. So he started in his mind to say goodbye to his wife and other loved ones. And the only reason I can tell you about the happy ending is that a certain Jeff Fitzpatrick from Albany was out doing four-wheel driving, as he likes to do. Miss um, Walter Bazalich's wife Mary had activated what's called an EPIRB, and I found out that means Emergency Position Indicating Radio Beacon, but um, Jeff Fitzpatrick didn't see that. He just got out to have a look at this stunningly beautiful, dramatic area and he thought he heard something. Sorry, he got out to look and saw Mary and she pointed him to where um, her husband had been fishing, at least where she thought he would have been. And then he saw the point of a fishing rod sticking out. And I walked down there thinking I was going to find the worst because the rocks were so wet. Then he heard this little plaintive cry for help. And he said when he realized there was a human being down there, well, by this time he knew who it was, he was freaking. He just, he thought he could slip, but he said the adrenaline kicked in and it only took him about 10 minutes to take him out, but it must have felt like a lifetime. And eventually he got under his arm, lifted him out, and by this time his legs had absolutely no feeling. Anyway, as is obvious, he got help, he recovered, he's not seriously injured, and he believes his guardian angels were looking after him. He actually said that, I believe in guardian angels. Now, a happy ending, but what are the lessons? Well, to be very boring, I think one major lesson is you don't go fishing alone, you don't go rock fishing alone, and especially not if you're in that vulnerable age group. But also, I thought it's very interesting for me, one of my favorite verses is Ephesians 2.10, which said, God has good works for us to do. And I believe that means you can start each day not knowing what's going to happen, who's going to come across your path, but there will be something good that God has already planned for you to do. So he was out for his fun four-wheel drive, ended up saving a life. The, the, the last and maybe the most important is call for help when you need it. I'm so glad that in our society now it's okay in fact, it's encouraged to ask for help with mental health issues, especially for men who've been very slow to do that. And finally, and maybe most importantly, but not excluding the other, call on God. He has never too busy, never too weary, 
and he's promised in Jeremiah 33.3, call on me and I will answer you. May we all do that. Good morning, everybody. The reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 18, verses... 23. It's okay. (laughs) Matthew 23, verses 1 to 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honour at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them Rabbi. But you are not to be called Rabbi, for you have only one master and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is the end of the reading. Amen and thank you, Sonia. And my apologies that uh, I didn't have your name on the uh, on the slide. I brought so many things up to date, but not everything. <laughs> so I do apologise. Well, uh, I did actually have Sonia's name in the leaflet. I didn't mention this before, but the leaflet's available on the on the web page. Uh, it won't be there right now because, it, well, it might be, uh, but. Uh, If you want to download the leaflet, you'll get a summary of what I'm about to say uh, on the theme of the terrible danger. And uh, and you'll see on the cover of it that I've used a sign. Think about root markers in Melbourne. I've used one of these root markers, which is distinctively Melbourne and which people in other places might never have seen before. Which one is it? You guessed it. It's this one. Turn, uh, right turn from left only. This is uh, called a hook turn in Melbourne. And uh, it's uh, designed to clear the centre of the road so that the trams can get through in the CBD. And it seems to be distinctively Melbourne. I don't know if they have it in other places. But we've been using the idea of markers because Matthew has put into his gospel, into the text when you read it, markers that indicate a certain uh, journey through the gospel, if you like. And we noticed as we came to the end of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus... Uh, had finished all these words, Matthew says, and then he tells us what happened next. But then a little further on, we find after Jesus had finished teaching his disciples, uh, the same sort of phrase appears. And then a little further on in the middle of the gospel, in chapter 13, when Jesus had finished these parables. And then in chapter 19, which uh, we looked at last week, when Jesus had finished these words, And now we come to chapter 26 and we discover when Jesus had finished all these words. Which words? Well, these are the words in chapter 23, chapter 24 and chapter 25. And so we've got three chapters, which strangely enough is about the same size as the Sermon on the Mount. And in between we have those other markers. So here are some chunks of teaching that Matthew has gathered together to present the new law, as it were, the new five books 
the teachings of the Messiah. And today we're thinking about this last block of teaching. And chapter 23 is our theme today. And I've, I've given it the title, our, our reflection, the title, The Terrible Danger. What is the terrible danger? It's the terrible danger of straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. It's, it's hilarious, but it's ghastly. A gnat was the smallest of the unclean animals in the old law. And the camel was the largest. And so Jesus is saying... We have to keep an eye on something very special here. Let's find out what it is. So the terrible danger, and we're looking at four headings to take us through the chapter. Sonia's read the first 12 verses to us, but if you've got a Bible open, you'll find that we're following it through. The first 12 verses are about fashion parades. The second uh, section is horrible hypocrisy, and it's a large section from verse 13 to verse 31. And then we've got the idea of blood guilt. There's a serious consequence to all of this. And then finally, uh, what I've called an ache to embrace. Perhaps something we're all feeling a little bit in this COVID lockdown. So let's take these things one at a time. First of all, the idea of fashion shows. You might remember last week the disciples had been asking about greatness. Who would be the greatest? And uh, concern with prestige and eminence was uh, uppermost in the minds of many people in a highly stratified society. How do we get to be the next grade up? The next? How do we get to be the next most next more important? And so the religious leaders of Jesus' time were not immune to this. And Jesus warns uh, that their teaching is one thing. But their lives are another. And he could see that there were people who were talking the talk, but not walking the walk. To start with, their clothing set them apart, their fashion. Uh, they, they had phylacteries. Those of you who uh, uh, have uh, seen uh, J- Jewish people praying in formal situations will know that they... They took uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, some of them very literally, and they made little boxes out of leather which, in which they inserted some of the scriptures and they tied them to their foreheads and to their arms. And Jesus is not, is not criticizing that per se, but he's saying here that the leaders are doing it in such a way as to be conspicuous. Bigger phylacteries, bigger uh, tapes t- t- holding it around the arm more conspicuous and uh, and so so there's a, there's a concern with how how things look they had prayer shawls but their tassels their knots were larger than for other people they wanted to be seen in their pursuit of prestige they were out to be seen in in all the eminent places the important seats at festivals and public acknowledgement these things mattered really mattered to some of these people they wanted to be called teacher and leader And these terms are not wrong in themselves, but the problem was that their goal was to be noticed and to be eminent. We noticed last week that Jesus, in speaking to his disciples, had said that if they're following him, uh, where God is concerned, the greatest is the one who serves the others. The greatest is the servant. And Jesus repeats this here in verse 11 and 12. We have one Father... One Lord Jesus Christ who invites us to serve one another. So much then for the externals, the the appearance, the fashion shows, the way we dress and parade ourselves and the positions we seek. Let's move on to this spelling out of the horror of hypocrisy. The, The ordination vows of Presbyterian ministers include this question. Our zeal for the glory of God, love to the Lord Jesus Christ, and a desire to save souls and not worldly interests and expectations, so far as you know your own heart, your great motives and chief inducements to the work of the holy ministry. I think we can see the need for this question. 
What is the motivation for coming into ministry? Because there's more than one motivation. Presbyterianism, while far less colourful and ornate than some ecclesiastical traditions, and sometimes even proud of its lack of ostentation, nevertheless comes with its own styles of worthiness and eminence. Perhaps no Scot was more attuned to such issues than the poet Robert Burns. Able on the one hand to detect and admire devout humility in the humble and poor, as in his poem The Cotter's Saturday Night, which beautifully observes the loving relationships and sincere Christian devotions in a family, a poor family, gathered at, at the end of the, the working day. The poem ends with these two lines from scenes like these, old Scotia's grandeur springs that makes her loved at home and revered abroad. Well, he could uh, detect uh, humble piety, the genuine article as it were, but on the other hand he was scathing in his use of satire uh, as he exposed it, what he saw uh, in Holy Willie's Prayer and, and uh, the Holy Fair, both long poems. I discovered during the week uh, a PhD student at uh, Louisiana State University had done an analysis of Burns satiric pieces and uh, she indicates that without, throughout his career he attacks five major targets insensitivity and intolerance that leads to oppression the hypocrisy of pretensions false pride greed for power money and knowledge and incompetence that injures others. Well, I thought the middle three are spot on, what Jesus is talking here. Actually, what we have in, these, in this section, chapter verses 13 through 31, is seven woes. The word woe occurs seven times. It's variously translated in modern versions. It's translated, how terrible. Um, Eugene Peterson says, you're hopeless. So here it is. What is, what is it? Well, again and again and again, and I won't go into the, to it in detail, but if you have an open Bible, you can check through and you'll find verse 13, 15, 16, 23, 25, 27, 29. You get the point, don't you? Again and again and again, Jesus is saying there's something really terribly wrong here. And what is the overall picture? Well, the overall picture is that they wash the outside of the cup while the inside is filthy like whitewashed tombs, another expression that comes out of this chapter. And they're unreliable. They have a sliding scale of veracity. You can, you, we, we heard about this in the very first uh, bracket of Jesus' teaching we looked at in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus talks about oaths. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be authentic. Speak the truth. Don't hedge what you're saying with various degrees of uncertainty. They were concerned with the minutiae, but they overlooked the absolute basics. They were concerned to strain out the smallest unclean thing, but they swallowed the largest unclean thing, a camel. And this put them in terrible danger. In danger, most translations have of hell. The word hell is actually the English translation of the the uh, Greek word Gehenna, to, which, which is uh, from, from the expression the Valley of Hinnom. When we came to Australia early on, very early on in New South Wales, we stayed with friends who had a sheep farm. And on the farm, there was a gully in which the family for generations had put their rubbish because out on their property, there were no rubbish collections. Now, I know that one of the sons of that family came and trawled through yesterday's rubbish to find today's treasures. Old bottles and things from a hundred years ago were much more interesting uh, in the cities than uh, they were in the country. But the point was that there was a, a gully where they could put the rubbish. And in Jerusalem there was a gully, a valley, the Valley of Hinnom, which was where terrible things had happened in the past. Jeremiah talks about it, for example. He talks about they sacrificed their children there. A 
It's a gruesome image of a terrible place. And in Jesus' day, it was the city's rubbish dump. And the smouldering rubbish all was down in Gehenna, the valley of the uh, Hinnom. So what, what we're being told here is that the religious finery and the status-seeking, the eloquent teaching and the theological pedigree, the earnest proselytizing, trying to win other people to their points of view, loading burdens on other people but avoiding them oneself, all these things prepared one for God's rubbish dump. What a terrible idea. We talk about black holes absorbing things. We have a problem with rubbish. How do we get rid of rubbish? The true cost of getting rid of rubbish. Well, Jesus is here and he's talking about the things that are rubbish and that are spoiling people's lives. But his aim is to get rid of rubbish. Let's move a little further. Let's move on to this idea of blood guilt. The hypocritical characteristics which marked the Pharisees as descendants of those who rejected the prophets. And they were guilty of shutting people out of the kingdom of God and shedding the blood of innocents, just like those who had killed the, the uh, prophets before them. Now, concerning this kind of hypocrisy, Eugene Peterson said, he never met anyone who started going to church with the intention of cultivating hypocrisy. But neither has he met anyone who is self-aware of hypocrisy. He says, like high blood pressure, it's a silent killer. But in these matters, it is the interior life of faith and prayer, and not the circulatory system that is damaged. Well, the Pharisees of whom Jesus was thinking had... Uh, fitted into exactly the pattern of the previous generations who killed the prophets and rejected the messengers that were sent. And though they protested they would never have done such a thing, Jesus knows that their long-standing opposition to him, that they're from that, that their protests are only skin deep. They are the true, true, true children of their prophet-killing ancestors, and they're about to complete that work. How? By handing him over to death. The guilt of Israel in rejecting its God-sent messengers would bring down judgment on the nation. Now it would be a bad mistake to read a chapter like this as simply moral denunciation, especially if we thought of it as moral denunciation of somebody else. That's halfway to committing the very mistake that's being attacked. Jesus, in fact is on his way to take the wickedness of the world on himself, including, for that matter, the wickedness that he was denouncing in this chapter. He's going to take it on himself and exhaust it, and he laments what he sees coming on the city, its people, its temple, as they plot to kill him and reject the Prince of Peace. How does he feel? The story is told of a forester uh, in California who in 1989 was patrolling after a wildfire had gone through uh, one of the national parks. And he was checking the kinds of things that foresters check on before areas can be reopened to public. And at one place where the fire had raged through, he realized he was looking at a burnt bird sitting on the ground. And he knocked it over with a stick to flick it out of the way. And when he did that, Three small chickens ran out from underneath the wings of the mother bird. Jesus felt like that mother bird. He ached to embrace those who mocked him and derided him. He is anticipating stepping into the place of judgment for the very people for whom he's speaking. Like the mother hen dying while it's protecting its chicks under his wings. His arms would be stretched wide for the whole human race, for you and for me. Let us remember as we think through this that we're coming to uh, Jesus' climax. Next week we're going to look at one of the most difficult chapters in, in this uh, in this. 
passage of teaching. But Jesus has in his mind what's in front of him. And we need to see that there is a terrible thing happening here. A terrible thing that we can be concerned about the tiny little details and forget the big picture of the Savior who came to atone for our sin and to gather us as his children. Amen. Let us join together in prayer once again. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we confess before you that hypocrisy, like a virus, still flourishes and causes widespread damage to your church. We have drifted from the honesty, humility, and integrity that you seek. We have pretended to be what we are not, and we have sought to be seen in the best seats and notable places. Please forgive us and create in us a transparency that reveals genuine faith and a humility that signifies the presence of Jesus our King, who went to Jerusalem lovingly pursuing hypocrites, charlatans, sinners of all kinds, people just like us, knowing what awaited him there. Please grant your Holy Spirit to guide our steps in the way of peace and exhibit the same ability to love and care for others, irrespective of their origins or character. Help us to support and encourage all who may be struggling to cope because of lost income, loneliness and isolation. We are saddened by the increasing numbers of COVID-19 cases in Victoria and grateful that the government has taken further steps to suppress the spread of it, putting a clear priority on the life and health of the whole community. Help citizens of all ethnicities to respond with a desire to promote the well-being of the whole community. Keep safe those who are vulnerable because of their roles in assisting the afflicted, thinking especially of doctors, nurses, ambulance personnel, working in suboptimal conditions often. We pray for the research teams working hard to develop a vaccine and treatment for COVID-19. May the results of their labors come to fruition soon and the blessings flow on to as many as possible. With the large redundancies announced this week, we pray for friends and neighbors who are feeling devalued or wondering what next. In our hearts, we name them before you. May the generosity of your people mirror your own extravagance. Grant wisdom to governments and uh, shaping folk fiscal policies, insights to entrepreneurs to create new avenues of productivity and success to job keepers looking to regain employment. We pray for victims of the random attacks that have taken place in the United Kingdom and perhaps other places too. And now the school holidays are upon us. We pray for the safety of all families with school-aged children. May kids find creative ways to enjoy the holiday and find joy in everyday things. Be with our friends and families in overseas locations where the pandemic seems so dangerously critical. With them we pray in the words the Lord Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As a postlude, uh, Amanda is going to pray Largo by Eccles, and I've put Eugene Peterson's quotation beside her on the screen to think about as you listen to this uh, lovely piece of music. Thank you.
Yeah, very beautiful. Thank you, Amanda. Final blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with you and with those whom you love, now and always. Amen.